Welcome to Beer Net Radio. Listen to on every continent except Antarctica. Beer Net Radio. Welcome to Beer Net Radio. This is Chris Becker with Better Roads. Hi there. And, and uh, th- welcome to the podcast, Chris. And Thanks, Harry. Better Roads is a non out uh, marketplace, DTC. And first of all, it looks like you're kind of an underachiever because I, I looked online and it looks like you're subbing some, is that Everest or something? What, what, tell me a little bit about your background. So my Mac, my personal background is, uh, uh, I'm a recovering management consultant, I guess, doing that since, uh, pretty well out of school. Um, and then also a tech startup kind of founder, but more in the technology space, uh, better roads came about more as a, like a lot of startups solving a, a personal uh, problem. Didn't want, wasn't drinking, didn't want to drink on vacation with my family, looking for alcohol-free beer, spent an afternoon kind of in a local coffee shop near a beach where the family was and procrastinating, working, and uh, surprised to see the number of, of alternatives that there were out there. Actually, you know, artisanal, highly crafted alcohol-free beers, and then even more surprisingly, um, breweries that were dedicated to alcohol free. And this was early 2019. And that kind of blew my mind. I was not expecting that. I was expecting to see maybe a couple brands, bigger names that uh, were kind of beyond what you typically would see in the grocery store. And that really started a journey of really digging into what became kind of an understanding that there was a a larger, larger uh, movement going on, larger innovation in the product space. Um, That led to a beer sampler pack, which was really meant for me. I wanted to find a way to test and try a few of these products without having to order six or 12 or more, have all the shipping and maybe liking some, not liking others. So that was kind of the impetus. And then, as you said, we started with e-commerce and now we're really kind of doubling down on the brands and that our customers are asking for most and getting into wholesale. And uh, we just launched an app where people can kind of look and see where to buy some of the products that are out there. Okay. And how do you source non-alc brands i mean where do you go to find what people are drinking out there it seems like that might be kind of tough because it's at this point still niche it is and i think that'll be true for a while um it's changing fairly rapidly but it's still so young and so niche it's got a long way to go so at first you know i was pretty naive i was looking to see what was out there and where to buy it um so a lot of alcohol free products um are available through the uh, the traditional three tier alcohol distribution system, particularly the big brands. So almost every major brand that I can think of, not every, a lo- many have an alcohol free 0.0 version. And most of the big brands, you'll even see they have the same blue kind of labeling effect. Right. Whether um, so that's that's moved a lot. Um, the Outside of that, we're really kind of, and that's not where we focus. We focus on a lot of the smaller pure play breweries. So we do a lot with, we basically go out and find them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, our fulfillment center in the East is in Connecticut. So one of the first people I went to go see actually, when I was just playing around with this idea in 2019 was athletic brewing. Uh, Mm -hmm. They're just down the street from us. um, And they've since raised a, a lot of money and they've grown very quickly and they're a pure uh, beer, beer producer. And, uh, they've just opened a major facility, uh, not too yep. far from us. And now they're, they're now the largest brewer in Connecticut of any type. Um, right. and then a lot of the others we've tested and tried, uh, at this point, we get a lot of samples sent to us. Um, yep. there's more and more founders coming in. Um, so, and they're, you know, on the East coast and the West coast. Uh, so I get to meet them and taste and try. And then we usually put them in those sample boxes that I mentioned and see what our customers think. Okay. And, and so can you share with our listeners a little bit of your business model and our, our listeners are, you know, beverage industry, mostly alcohol, beverage industry sure. professionals. So, you know, um, so you're kind of a, if I'm hearing you right, you're a, a DTC marketer, but you're also kind of their wholesaler too. I mean, I'm assuming they drop ship to your or don't tell me how it how it works. Sure, yeah, yeah, sure. And because it kind of speaks to the earlier point, it's such a new industry. So much of this, when it comes to the customers, is still about education and getting liquid on lips. 
Um, and there's other, uh, and, and we, you know, beer is a big piece for us, but there's also alcohol-free wines, alcohol-free spirit alternatives, direct um, ready to drinks, pretty well everything you see behind me. We have a little sample shop here. Um, so our first piece and our biggest piece is D to C because it is such a new space. How do we get product right to the customer and get feedback from them? Cause they really tell us what they like, what they don't like, what they're willing to pay, what they're not willing to pay e-commerce, uh, especially for heavy liquids and glass that freeze and break easily. Isn't the, wait, wait a minute. Are you telling me that beverages are heavy? Yeah. Yeah. I wish I'd I mean, thought that through more when I first started this. Business. It, it's a, it's yeah. a bitch and it's something that it's really hard to get around. You know, yeah. we haven't figured that out yet, but uh, no. I hear you on that. <laughs> and uh, with the alcohol free, we have the added uh, bonus of uh, it freezing at a higher temperature. So uh, right. um, uh, D2C is hard under the best of circumstances that adds an extra level of challenge. Um, we've learned a lot along the way, the hard way. I wish I could say the easy way, but it was the hard way. Um, so that's, that's a, it's still a critical piece because a, it's a, it's a big piece of our business from a volume perspective, but it's a challenge in terms of, um, of margins and profits. Uh, but we learn a lot and we have that direct relationship with a customer. And we do a lot of work with certain beer producers where we can test and try, get them into a box, see what their customers think and give them then share that feedback. The other piece of it though, is, we're really kind of a 360 model. So when we create a relationship with one of these brands and, you know, maybe relative to what sounds like your, your listeners, uh, relatively small, you know, these are not mm -hmm. massive uh, uh, multinational corporations. Um, these are artisanal uh, founder owned and operated. So we'll work with them on the online to get that customer relationship and feedback, but also wholesale. So that means on trade, so rest, more and more restaurants are looking for highly curated options. Our customers are demanding it more. We presented and exhibited at the restaurant show in Chicago, um, and it's still you know early days. And then off trade, uh, because it is alcohol free, um, in many states, and in, in, uh, where you're able to distribute these products through the non three tier system, and they can also be uh, sold in unlicensed establishments. Um, right. in some cities, in some States, sorry, uh, the, the, the alcohol distributors are actually precluded from selling what are deemed to be non-alcoholic products. And therefore, even though it's beer, it's, it's non-alcohol, non-alcoholic. There was a recent ruling in uh, New York state along those right. lines. Okay. Are you dealing with mostly de-alcoholized products or, or do you, or do you deal with like non-alcoholic like like this or like Ourobora or something yeah. like that? It's in terms of the techniques, uh, both. So it depends on the categories. Beer, there are dealkalized, and then there is some that are brewed uh, where they're brewed up to the point of 0.5 or less. Um, which, so we carry which is, both. Which is better? Like, uh, is that a snobby it, thing to say kind of? Uh, I mean, well, a lot of the newer brewers would say that if it's done right, brewing up to, because some of the dealkalization de alkalization processes are like kind of like a gut punch to the pro to the liquid. Um, mm -hmm. So if you can do a technique that gets you the flavor without having to dealkalize, I personally believe that's the future of not just beer but wine, uh, alcohol free alternatives and things like that. Because right. the dealkalization process, especially if you're using heat, is very damaging. Uh, the easiest way to dealkalize is to boil off the alcohol. And, right. Cause it, cause it's also it, the most damaging. Yeah. 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 Now there are centrifugal, you know, filter filtration processes. They are more cumbersome, more expensive, more time consuming. So I think you're seeing more innovation and, you know, a lot of the alcohol free from a beer perspective, this isn't in Europe, in Belgium and Germany, this is much more of a mature industry and a lot of uh, beer making courses in Belgium Al making be alcohol-free beer is one of the things you learn. There are really? hops that are designed specifically to be used for alcohol-free brewing. Interesting. And in and, and brewing up to 0.5% to is, I would imagine, very difficult. It has to be very slow and, and, and contained. And, and yeast, I've heard, is a wild, wild organism. Um, That's what I hear. I'm, I'm certainly not an expert, um, but I, from yeah. the folks that I've spoken to in this space... Um, if we could get rid of gravity and yeast... This business would be great. <laughs> yeah. And, and, 
and employees <laughs> and, and relic regulations. That's and, right. <laughs> through, <laughs> all anyway, that fun stuff. All the fun stuff. Okay, so um, so you've been in, in business a couple of years, and how's it going? So, um, uh, uh, well, just how's it going? Sure. Um, as I said, it's a very early space, um, but it is becoming more of a mature kind of segment in North America. It's already proven to be kind of a successful segment in, in Europe, um, not just in beer, but in the other categories there in some ways, you know, even five or more, more years ahead. So we've seen a lot of rapid growth in terms of top line revenue. So we're a lot of product is happening, moving, um, things like dry January or even the holiday season are, are, are very successful. We're seeing a lot of, um, traction with, uh, certain demographics. So, you know, younger people, certainly younger than me tend to drink less. Um, yep. there's a lot of news and, and about that and kind of different reasons why people would drink. Most of our customers are don't abstain from alcohol. They just are not drinking at certain times or drinking less. And this is just giving them more adult beverage choices. Um, so that part of the business and the e-commerce is going well, the, the wholesaling is just starting and that really ties to restaurants and, and, um, unlicensed establishes establishments getting kind of a, their head around that this is a, a place they need to be in, um, with restaurant owners, for example, we talk a lot about, you know, you're not really losing an alcohol sale. If somebody's coming in for a glass of wine or, or a beer, they're going to get that. But if you're really upselling a water or, or some other product right. where most people just, you know, I kind of diet joke, Coke. I mean, Diet Coke. It's something where they I feel mean, like they're, they're missing out. Yeah, it's a, iced tea it's a, or, yeah, yeah, it's not an adult beverage where they're getting to participate socially with their friends. It's like sometimes call it the O'Doul's effect. It's you're going into a restaurant already assuming, even if they have something, it's going to suck. Um, yeah. Not that, Hey, there's actually some really good products with really good choices and you're actually going to be happily wanting to participate. So that's newer, but it's growing very quickly. And then the part of the business that I think is, probably the, you know, is, is the newest, but is, it has the most potential is the, um, the data, uh, area. So we have an app similar given we're, you know, talking to your beer listeners, you know, if there's an app for beer called untapped, which is basically sure. it's on your phone, it's anything you want to know about beer. Um, yeah. there's also a similar pro app for that for wine called the vino. So we have an app that started out in the UK, uh, called better without. And basically it's, same idea, but it's, it's the full inventory of all the alcohol free products, beer, wine, you can look at it by, is it 0.0 .0 or is it 0 0.5? And then we, uh, you know, based on your location, it'll tell you where you can go and get these, these, these products. And that's driving a lot of data and insights mm -hmm. where we're, and we're offering that data both to our, you know, our, to our makers, the producers that we carry, the distributors and the retailers. So more and more you know, with that wholesale channel, if we can show them what's selling and who is asking about what and what people are rating, where people are, you know, promoting where they, where they think we should carry uh, a listing on our app. That's been a big piece, the data and insights. And we're using that to really differentiate ourselves in terms of the value we offer to producers and retailers. Um, so getting to the point. Yeah. Interesting. So, what, what is the app called again? Uh, better without. Better without. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, brilliant because I, I guarantee marketers would love to have access to untapped when it was getting started. Okay. And, and I imagine the margins are, are, and they have to be high to be shipping this stuff. And, and how do consumers feel about paying for something that does not have alcohol in it? Do they feel cheated in any way or is it the premiumness of it? Um, I like to think that it's moving to the premiumness of it, but I would say because it is such a new space, and this was my own experience. So your first reaction is, well, if it doesn't have alcohol, I should be paying less. Right. Um, whereas really what we're talking about is a better for you beverage where the, the, ha the, the fact that it's absent of alcohol carries with it other benefits besides right. the lack of the side effects, um, lower calories, and then you're seeing a lot of growth in functional. So, um, you know, beers with an additional something that might be some functional benefit like Kenya Forks and uh, three spirits and there's other pro more and more products coming to the market, not even addressing the whole cannabis beverage side of things um, is happening. Um, I think a, a THC infused beer, if it's not already in the market is, I know that that's being worked on by a few 
uh, sure. companies. So um, yeah. at first, and, you know, I'll, and I'll say on the e-commerce side, margins are tough. Um, as we've grown and can make bigger commitments for volume, it's getting better because we're dealing with it on the cost side. And then, you know, we're pretty focused on adding value through curated boxes, subscriptions, sample packs, where we can justify a, a value add and a higher price point because we're adding convenience and hopefully yeah. saving them money if it's, again, not avoiding buying products that maybe they wanted to try but may not like and didn't want to have to buy at volume. Um, the biggest challenge on the D2C side is the Amazon effect, which is everyone expects it tomorrow and with free yeah. shipping. Um, and we, you know, we're, we're not Amazon. So that's, a, we do actually do D to C fulfillment for some of the brands that we carry where we kind of have an omni-channel approach. So we have our flagship sites, but we also fulfill to Amazon, but that's, that's the biggest challenge too, is just the expectations on D to C have become so, so, um, high, you know, mm. in terms of when and how much, um, which is why our, our real focus right now is, is on the, uh, building out the wholesale. Cause that really mm. gives us a nice compliment to be able to kind of get enough volume and then be able to, to uh, make it commercially viable. Right. And, and when you say wholesale and you're talking about unlicensed restaurants, are, are you using like food service to get it there? I mean, yeah. Or so, I mean, we're not discriminating. So um, we have, we do, you know, restaurants are licensed or unlicensed, but it could also be non-traditional locations like coffee shops. I thought yeah. that's, providing that I think it's going to take more time for some of the, their, the owners to kind of see where it fits. Cause it doesn't really compute at first glance, um, for whole off trade wholesale, uh, more and more, we're actually now selling some of the products that we exclusively carry back into the three tier system. So we yeah. buy some product from the three tier system, but more and more now we're selling into them. And then yes, the food and uh, health uh, dis food distributors. Uh, we we sell into U.S. Foods, for example. So if if uh, U.S. Foods accounts want to buy alcohol free products, they'll uh, it's it's us on the back end. So it gives right. them the ability to add that category without the overhead. And now we're working on which ones we think will scale. We also do what I call alcohol free plug and play, where we can do fulfillment for gifting and subscription platforms that might sell clothing or flowers or other types of products where alcohol free is a nice compliment where we basically right. plug in. And if someone orders, then it's actually coming out of our, out of our, yeah. uh, our warehouse. What are your hottest selling products? I, I've heard that non alk wine is big, like, and are there any, um, I don't know if you want to call out producers that, you know, favor you have your favorites, but, uh, you know, what, what's, what's hot right now with, with um, wine is, a big seller. Um, and it, it is a bit counterintuitive at first, because if you, from a tasting perspective and, you know, within the beer industry, there was probably debate even here, but that category is actually the alcohol-free beers are the closest in terms of taste innovation relative to their alcohol cousins. If you like wine, I would actually put at the opposite end of the spectrum. If you try an alcohol-free wine, um, it's better than the, what I call the first generation wine, which is basically grape juice with some foil, maybe around yeah. the bottle, maybe <laughs> right. it's carbonated. It's at the, it's at the checkout aisle in your grocery store. Now you actually have, you know, wine that's been properly and carefully dealkalized with some dosage or juice put back in to attempt, you know, it's a solid attempt, but the flavor gap is still much greater compared to mm. their alcohol cousins, partly because with wine, even more so, and, and, you know, high craft spirits as well alcohol is an extremely effective flavor carrier. Mm. Um, and when you take it out, I kind of joke, it's the alkalizing a, a dark red is like giving it open heart surgery. Um, <laughs> so, right. but it's still a big, it's one of the biggest sellers. So, uh, and it seems to be because it gives people so much adult choice about um, having a food pairing or being able to celebrate with the glass and the color and the smell and the bottle that it's the experience or almost the ritual that seems to have importance and, and the, and the quality is getting better. So wine is big. Um, beer is definitely, you're seeing a lot of, um, well, not a lot of, there are a few players that are, have really focused on alcohol free beer that you're starting to see grow quite quickly. Um, athletic is one 
uh, big drop, uh, Lucky Saint out of the UK um, to varying degrees have started to look at the US. Uh, Brew Dog, which is a big brewery and bricks and mortar in, in uh, the UK has their own. They actually started their first alcohol-free beer as a joke because people were giving them bad press because they've had a very high alcohol content beer. And right. the owner, uh, I forget his name, but he's uh, Jim, pretty, Jim Watts, I think. Yeah, he's quite yeah. Uh, outspoken. <laughs> yes. So he did, he did, uh, he did an alcohol-free. My understanding of the story was as a almost as a joke, and it became it was very successful. So <clears throat> you're seeing a lot. Those would be examples of people I've seen. You know, Lucky Sight, Lucky Saint, for example, is available on tap all throughout young London pubs. Mm-hmm. Um, Heineken 0.0 is rumored to be coming out with on tap in London soon. Um, and you're starting, I think that's something to look out for in 2023 in the alcohol free beer world in the U S the pub culture is not the same. So you don't have that same critical mass and ability to distribute to a chain of pubs, maybe as you right. do there, but, um, I'm seeing a lot more of those products and others into, um, uh, uh like, uh, fast food chains, uh, where, right. where they want to have a better alcohol free beer or more options. Well, cool. Well, that's great. Uh, thanks for being on, Chris. Uh, appreciate your candor, and uh, you know, I, I wish you the best. I think it's exciting. Uh, we've been covering a lot more of the non-alc space, and I don't. When I say non-alc, I'm not talking about energy drink. Well, actually, we we are covering that too, but uh, it's a dynamic field, and uh, looks like you're at the tip of the spear there. So yeah, Harry, uh, enjoyed the time. Thanks for having me, and uh, happy to chat about. Uh, any of the brands uh, whenever you get a chance. All right, cool. All right, take care. Thanks, take care.